The reason people have midlife crises is because they get into something that somebody told them to do, and they hate it. And 30 years later, they finally rebel against it. But if they don't know what's going on, they just pick another thing that they shouldn't be doing and spend another 20 years, now they're really upset. When the truth is, if you focus on what vocation is, and this is how we did education in America for 300 years, from about um, 1607 to 1930s. This was how we did education. And in the 1930s, we had a depression, and we had a president who said, we need a, a national education system. It had been coming on for about 40 years prior to that, but really the depression allowed them, gave them the vehicle to bring it in full force, and we had a new system. This is system A, this is system B. And we've done this new system for about 70 years. And I tell you, go back and look at the people this system produced, and go look at the people this system produced, and you decide which one you want to follow. But we don't do that, because we don't teach this history. We only tell you this is how it is, and this is how it's got to be, and, and nobody knows that they have any choices, but there are all kinds of choices. But we have to be informed first, right? Any questions on this? this does this kind of grab you a little bit? Does this resonate? Mm -hmm. Resonates for me, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, as we're going through the rest of this lecture, I, what I want to do is I want to break up these false synonyms. There's a bunch of them. I want to start thinking virtues here, skills over here. Very different. We don't stop, we've got to stop mixing them and start talking about them as separate things. Which ones should be pilot? Virtues or, or skills? Virtues. Virtues should be pilot. Can't be if they're all the same thing, so we have to separate them out. Okay? How about character over here? Tools over here. Quality of life over here, standard of living. We talk quality of life and standard of living as if, as if they're synonymous. They're not synonymous. In our culture, when you have a quality of life issue, what do you do? How do you solve it? You go shopping. <laughs> Which is actually a standard of living thing. You don't solve quality of life with standard of living. I know plenty of people with lots of houses and lots of money who drink themselves to sleep every night. And I know plenty of people in modest conditions who are happy and love life. It's quality of life, standard of living. It's two separate things. You've got to talk about them as separate things. Just like uh, virtues and skills are two separate things. We've got to quit confusing our kids. Education's over here, schooling's over here. We're going to talk about how those two are different here in a minute. So here, here we have this concept of virtues. When we want virtues to be a, a pilot, we want it to drive the whole thing. And if that's the case, then where does... Where is the foundation of virtue got to be found? If we want it to drive society, if we want it to be the pilot, where does it have to be most evident? In your home. In your home, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. And where, how, what is the best way to promote or teach virtue? Modeling. Showing modeling. Yeah. Modeling it. Mm -hmm. And who's doing the modeling? Okay. The parents. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we're all familiar with the situation that's happened in Haiti recently, the earthquake there. Well, about six years before that happened, there was a little girl named Ariana, and she lived in Santa Barbara with her family. And her parents were, were Christian-based people, and they were involved in ministries and service and that kind of jazz. And she had this culture. So at the ripe old age of eight, she decides to uh, uh, you know, sort of adopt one of these kids from Haiti, seven years old. She's ripe old age of eight. So she's sending off her $5 a month, or whatever it is. She gets the pictures and the things back and forth, and she's, she's helping this kid. But a year later, her dad walks in her, her bedroom. She's full nine years old now. She's got a huge jar of quarters. He says, well, what do you think you're doing with that? She says, Dad, don't laugh. That's the foundation of my orphanage and hospital that I'm going to build in Haiti. Two years later, their family was living in Haiti running an orphanage and a hospital led by a nine-year-old. Why? Because mom and dad had created a foundation of virtue in their home, and she did the most obvious thing. She just followed their example. She got a passion about something, and she went crazy with it. That's what you do when you come from a background of virtue. It's a natural progression. That's just what you do. There's a problem, though. You have this base of virtue. You see all this application. All of a sudden, you find the thing you're supposed to do, and you get excited about it, and then you get very scared. Because what happens is you go from passion, the elation of passion, to all of a sudden you have a full understanding, a full awareness that you don't have the skills to build an orphanage and a hospital. 
and you get a little freaked out. And so you go to mom and dad or your teachers or whoever, and you start looking for people to give you the skills. And you get so wrapped up in this because you have to do this. This is like in your blood. And so you've got to go get these skills. You know you don't have them. And there's a lot of energy in this and a lot of initiation. And who's initiating it? The, the parents and the teachers, right? No. It's the student initiating this. This is student-initiated education. Student-driven education. And it's a natural process that everybody is born with. And in our culture, by the time you're 10, we normally have it bred out of you. We burn it, we kill it, we stab it. So by the time you get into your teens, this is gone. And we wonder why we have so many problems with teens, with, with, even with adults, because they have no self-initiation, no self-drive, because we killed it. <clears throat> Let me give you some, some quick definitions. Don't, don't bother writing these down. I just want you to feel these. These come out of my big fat dictionary called the Oxford. Did you get that Oxford? <laughs> come out of that big fat dictionary. I sort of did a composite because we don't have time to read pages and pages of stuff. But here's a composite. Here's the definition of schooling. Just sort of feel this, OK? Any activity that is designed to instruct, inform, or train a person how to act. A teach, uh, to teach a person his part, a crowd or a group, you know, like a school of fish. Doing things as a group. You feel that one? OK, here's education. To bring up, nurture, or rear from childhood so as to form their habits, manners, intellectual and physical aptitudes. Develop intellectual and moral powers generally. This is done individually or with a few. Is there a difference between schooling and education? Huge. Do you educate in your homes, or do you school in your homes? Which one? Yeah, yeah. If you educate or you want to educate, can I recommend that you stop calling it homeschooling if you're home educating? Don't call it homeschooling. Call it home education. In fact, I, my wife and I came to the conclusion that, that we didn't homeschool. We actually did something else. We came up with a new name. It's called family education. And this is our definition. Any educational pursuit which is grounded in family values and virtues Directed by the student, supported by the parents. Think about this. Where's the parent involvement here? Where should it be? Here, the example, and support. This is driven. This is the passion of the student. They take advantage of our environment we created. They get a drive, and then they come to us, and we help them. But whose education is this? It's theirs. But we act like it's ours. We act like we are responsible for getting them education. No, we don't. Mm -mm. Think about this for a second. How could you be responsible to God for something you have no control over? Because you can't control whether your children learn or not. You cannot. You can try. Go ahead, try. But you cannot control it. They control it. All you can do is influence it. So how could you be responsible for something over which you have no control? You're not. You're responsible for setting an example and supporting. The rest is up to them. And if you exemplify this passion, if you exemplify the acquisition of skills, they will follow. It's either that or a system that has a 50% failure rate. If you have four children, that means two of your kids are going to fail automatically. And if you're the average American, then unfortunately, it's a higher ratio than that because of a poor system. Okay. This, this concept of, of family education or leadership education or Thomas Jefferson education got its name, got it, came into existence about 20 years ago. Um, Oliver DeMille and myself, Rachel DeMille and a bunch of others, we were college students, we were going to different schools, and we were not happy with the educational experience that we were having. We were idealists, and when you don't have any money, you can be an idealist, right? <laughs> and, and so we were looking around for different options, and Oliver found the story of this guy named Thomas Jefferson being educated by a guy named George Wythe. And we said, oh, man, that's what we want. We won't want to be Thomas Jeffersons. And so we said, let's go find a school like that, and then we'll go to that school together, right? And we couldn't find it. It didn't exist in America. So we made one. 